to the channel and today's video is all about our yellow-tailed Kribos and what fantastic snakes they are too. So first off, <clears throat> for sure, none of these snake videos will be about snakes I don't keep or snakes I have no experience of in the wild. So if we do any videos about those kind of things, it will be when someone else is presenting them about snakes they keep. I'm not going to just churn out videos about snakes that I've researched on the internet, like a lot of um, YouTube people do, and just tell you generic stuff. It's just going to be about our snakes, snakes we find in the wild, <coughs> and so on and so forth. Um, so this video is about our yellowtail Kribos, Drymarkon Karais, so the indigo snake and the Kribos are the same thing, they're a group of snakes, Drymarkon. And equally, equally, we're not going to go on all about large detail about where these snakes come from in the wild, what they do in the wild, um, what they get up to, and so on and so forth, the weather, and etc. and etc. So if you want to find more detailed information about that out, um, one place you could check out on YouTube is Snakes and Adders. Uh, often in their snake care videos, they'll go to great lengths and put in a lot of detail, background detail, about the snakes in the wild, which can and can't be helpful. But for our point of view, I'm going to tell you how we keep them or how more experienced people than me keep them. And just basically about keeping these snakes in captivity. So yellowtail Kribos, they're the longest of the indigo and Kribo snake family, the dry marcons, possibly getting up to 10 feet long. Um, our male now is eight feet long and uh, generally longer and slenderer and far more flighty and runny than the other members of the dry mark on the other members of the indigo snake group. Uh, certainly we've got a young black tail Kribo, which will just mould around your hands gently and interested. Yellow tails, big or small, on the whole, they're on the move all the time, all the time. Um, when they're small, like all, all baby snakes really, all hatchlings, they want to feel secure. You're not going to see a lot of them. We keep them in this size tub when they're hatchlings. I'll show you in a second, very basic. Uh, they've got a hide. They've got water. These snakes need good, clean, fresh water. They're a thirsty snake and they can't be drinking rubbish. So clean your water bowls and change the water regularly, very regularly. And they must always have water available. Now, for our hatchlings, at the moment, we're using a queer compost, like a queer peat fiber. I've had one disaster only with small hatchling snakes when it comes to um, substrate. And it's something, because of that disaster, they were really special snakes to me. I really make sure I don't do. So if your snake can swallow particles of substrate with their food, so often food like chick legs or salmon, the snake's going to move it around. doesn't matter if you put it on a sauce or whatever. It's going to get dressed with its substrate. If they swallow particles of substrate, of wood-based substrate, which they can't digest, if that then goes through their system and it's too big to come out their cloaca, their bum to you, if it's too big to pass through, it's stuck with it inside its body and it will eventually die. Um, so I always use substrate that if it sticks to the food, will go through. They never get impaction because it sticks to it as long as the food can go through their bodies. So the queer, the queer compost, the queer peat mix is very absorbent. It's incredibly cheap, really. You can, in here in the UK, you can buy it from, from queer products, from a, a dealer of just that product in blocks that you moisten and, and it expands. Um, the good thing about that with any, all of our hatchling snakes is if you put an inch or two in the base of their enclosure, it's amazing. Most young snakes, whether they've got a hide or not, they'll burrow into it. And for the small snakes, you can keep that substrate nice and moist. And that means they don't dehydrate. Those snakes do better in a slight, not wet, but a very slightly damp substrate. So we don't bother putting in a moss hide box at that stage. So as the snakes grow, you can increase the size of their plastic rug tub, whatever you want to call it, make sure it's secure, make sure it's well ventilated. And then we move them on into two or three foot enclosures, your more typical vivarium with a glass front. Uh, if you're going to keep your hotel Kribos, again, the faff of social media, which, how, what size enclosure is too small, what's too big. At the end of the day, you have to talk a minimum size. Realistically, six foot by two foot by two foot is you sort of, you go to minimum size for your, your Kribos. Don't be put off by the fact they're gonna to go to eight or nine feet long. They're gonna spend a lot of their time in a damp hide box, not a lot bigger than this, believe it or not. 
if you keep your snakes as pets and you get them out all the time and actively. I know people that keep pup members of the indigo snake family in 4B2B2. Sounds small, again, most of the time they've been something this small, but that's if you're gonna get your snakes out on a daily for a bit of exercise. So look at 6B2B2 as your minimum for an adult. Go as big as you like. It doesn't mean they're gonna use it, but the option's there for them if they like. So we've gone up through the housing sizes. Water, very important. Substrate is key with a dry mark on genus because like most big colubrids, they can do some pretty, pretty nifty poos. But if you read about this genus online, you'll say to people, I oh, stopped keeping them because they're too smelly. I wouldn't keep those, they stink. Honestly, it's an utter load of rubbish. It's an utter load of rubbish. They, they're just not. And I think it comes down to your substrate. So something dry and absorbent just kills the smell and soaks up the substrate, that soaks up the poo feces in a small spot, which you can easily spot clean there and then on a daily basis if need be. Um, so for the bigger snakes, we move up to coir chips. So the, the coir wood chips, shredded coir, it's, we use it dry and it's mega absorbent. It just soaks everything into a spot, spot clean, job done. Honestly, they're, not, they're just not that smelly. If you want to keep bull snakes, they're a lot smellier than the indigo snake family, for sure. Um, but if you're keeping these snakes on a dry substrate, then as they get bigger, then not only do they need a water bowl, fresh water, they also need, or really, really helpful, to have a, a damp hide box. So I use black hide boxes, hole cut in the lid that they can get in and out of easily. And I fill that with more of the same, more coir chippings, but I keep that very damp in there. And then I'll put another hide at the other end that's just the hide, so they can, they've got a hide at the hot end, a hide at the cool end, and they have got the, the choice of going somewhere damp or somewhere dry. If you go down the route of keeping your substrate damp for your grown on and your adult indigo snakes, the problem you've got is, just like my false water cobras, these snakes have a high metabolism. They eat little and often, they poo a lot and often. A wet, sloppy poo in a damp substrate, you are now providing bacteria with the perfect place to breathe. Dampness, food and humidity and warmth. You're now, you've now got a humid area that's full of bacteria or can be full of bacteria and that's going to end up with giving your snake scale rot. So go for the dry substrate when they're adult, spot clean and the damp hide box for sure. Lighting, it's up to you. It's up to you. These snakes are going to thrive and live to a ripe old age and it doesn't matter what lighting, if any, you provide them with. UV, no UV, light, ambient light, they're gonna thrive and do exceptionally well, and you're not gonna see any ill effects at all from not using UV. However, um, someone that breeds an awful lot more of these snakes than I ever do, and knows far more about them than I do, he's definitely noticing that if he provides UV, they use it. Now, he's even told me that he's provided fluorescent light at one end, um, ultraviolet fluorescent light at the end of the UV spectrum, and he insists they're seeking out the UV lamp to bask under rather than just uh, the daylight lamp that you, you know, you'd use in your house, a sort of a generic um, fluorescent tube. So why? Who knows? Do they need it? They don't need it, for sure they don't need it. Um, my, one of mine has UV, one of them doesn't. And I'll show you an enclosure I've just set up that I'm going to move. I'm going to move the adult soon and I'll run you through that enclosure in a second. Um, so lighting's entirely up to you. They're quite happy with just ambient room lighting. And they do breathe, live exceptionally well. Food, anything. They'll get they'll eat anything. These things have a high metabolism and a real food response. And as you'll see with my adults, they have also got the ability to stack on the weight to the point they're fat at the end of the day. Um, mine have been fed really well because it's a breeding season now um, before coming together and it's surprising how quickly they stack on weight. Not bothered about that with female because she's going to put all that into eggs and she needs that body mass. The boy, he doesn't need to be as big as he is for sure, but my paranoia is he's so much bigger than her, he might eat her. These things are off your fagus, they eat other snakes in the wild, but anything you offer them, they'll probably eat it. But for sure I start mine on pinkies, rat pups, trout or salmon pieces with a skin on and the legs of Dale chicks with the with the scaly foot bit cut off 
um, and all have a preference and getting these guys going as youngsters is a bit hit and miss but this year really they've all, they've all gone pretty well they've either eaten trout or chicks or pinkies and then over time I've scented whichever they like with the other food with what they like and they've gone on uh, to eat just about anything as they get bigger a hungry Kribo, just like a hungry false water cobra or a, you know, or a hungry indigo snake even, is going to come flying out of the vivarium for something on tongs. I just drop feed mine in the evening and they usually eat it straight away, but I don't weigh things around. I drop feed because I don't want to encourage them to come whizzing out thinking they've got to catch their food. Um, an eight or nine foot snake launching out of its bib because it's hungry and see something being waved around. It's, it's good fun, but they miss quite often. And the less your tongs along, that also means they miss and grab whatever else is waving, usually your thumb or something like that. So feeding's no problem at all because you're going to get these snakes captive bred, I hope, and you're going to get them from the breeder once they're settled and feeding. So he's going to tell you what, he or she's going to tell you what they're eating. And if you want to feed them something different, scent it with what they like and they will have an amazing food response. Feed them about every four days while they're young and then slow it down to once a week as they get bigger. You're not gonna overfeed a youngster. You really aren't. They're just gonna put that into growing longer. They're not gonna get fat, they're just gonna get longer. And they're probably gonna hit, without without overfeeding at all, they're gonna hit three feet in 12 months time, without a doubt. Remember, these are longer and thinner than most of the other dry marcon, most of the other indigo snakes. So where are we? We've done lighting, we've done water, important substrate, food, enclosure size and um, do they need height in their enclosures not really they're really a ground snake will they climb yes sometimes some more than others but the other tail crevos seem to be quite happy more or less on the ground for sure now temperature is probably one of the most critical things other than cleanliness and cleanliness of the water bowl temperature is critical these are not your pythons they're not your boas these things are gonna die and get really restless and stressed out in high temperatures. By all means, have a basking spot around 30 degrees centigrade. If you're American, go on Google and swap it over. 30 degrees C, a nice little basking spot where they can curl up under. It needs to go down to something like 22, 22 degrees really at the cool end. So they've got a really good gradient, but the cool end is way more important than the hot end. I can tell you now, um, one of my probably has 28 degrees in a small area and the rest of the area 22 to 24 degrees centigrade they're a cool snake like all the dry mark on they don't like heat these crebos the yellowtail crebos have a massive range across south america their range is enormous and of course you get you get different locales and there's slightly different colors and so, so on and so forth but Generally, even though you think of something South American, thinking of a hot, sweaty rainforest, they still don't want loads of heat. Put the heat in one end, and make sure the rest cools right down. I can tell you now, they spend most of their time in the cool end of their enclosure. It's amazing. So breeding, breeding of this amazing um, species, like all the dry mark on, they seem to prefer winter time. They seem to prefer the autumn, we're in the UK, it's November now, we're in the Northern Hemisphere, they're from the Southern Hemisphere. They seem to respond well to temperatures cooling down at night for a few days, even cooler than I've already told you. Um, introduce them out to female, I'm actually gonna do it the other way around later, I pair them on and off. Um, again, someone that knows far better than me, he tells me he soaks his enclosures, sprays them and mists them to mimic a rain season, and he ups the temperature a little bit and that triggers his to breed. So compared to the indigo snake from North America, he takes the, the view that if you're from South America, you're probably gonna be triggered by a bit of a rainy season, increased humidity and a bit of an increase in temperature. He knows more than I do about breeding them. Last year, um, our female produced a good clutch of eggs in the spring from a winter November breeding and all but one of the babies hatched perfectly on their own. So one dud and the rest hatched brilliantly. The eggs, the eggs again, they don't like high temperatures. We're not talking 28 degrees centigrade like your colubrid eggs in general. We're talking lower, 24, 25 degrees. Cooler temperature, good healthy youngsters, about 110 days to hatch. Normally most of the colubrid snakes, 60 days. So those cooler temperatures, a long hatch period, 
good healthy snakes at the end of it. And again, once they've shed their skin for the first time in about a week after hatching, getting them feeding, isn't it? So I'm going to show you some snakes. I'm going to show you some enclosures um, and just enjoy these amazing snakes. The worst thing is I wanted to make this video before my last hatchling of this year went to its new home in two days time. I've uh, just checked the adults and the sub adults. They're pretty much all in blue getting ready to shed. So I'm now going to show you some incredibly stunning snakes looking at their very, very worst.